Okay, so Jen Murphy is our first speaker. So Jen is a PhD student in the Centre for Data Analytics and Society based in the Social Statistics Department at Manchester University. Her research interest is in equality and specifically the impact of deprivation on health. Okay, so I'll, I'll skip straight to the first slide because I've already been introduced. So I'm not going to go through all the background. You know, we all know about the pandemic and I've again got a child at home again, homeschooling as of this morning. Um, but the work I'm going to talk about today considers the non-COVID impact of the pandemic and it uses the COVID data sets collected as part of understanding society. So we hypothesised that as a result of the pandemic and the accompanying lockdown, that well-being is impacted and that there's likely to be widespread indirect effects which are important to policymakers and health professionals as we as a population recover from what's been really quite an unprecedented experience. And further to that, in this work, we hypothesise that the impact's not been felt equally amongst the population and that there will be deprivation effects in the impact of COVID on non-COVID related wellbeing. So on this slide here, I've reproduced the research questions that we've addressed as part of this work. Uh, there's been widespread reports in the press of a mental health crisis. So we looked at the reported decline in wellbeing. We wanted to confirm this was true and also to look at whether or not there were deprivation effects in the extent of the decline. And likewise, if well-being was being more adversely affected for people who had underlying medical conditions. And we then wanted to explore whether or not this decline was static or mobile during the first wave and whether those changes were experienced equally. Well-being is a bit of a, a loose term, so I'm just going to specifically define what we mean in this study. We use standard measure of mental distress, which is the GHQ-12. There's 12 questions, things like, have you recently been feeling unhappy or depressed? And the respondent can give one of four answers. It's a fairly standard tool, but I just want to draw your attention to the fact that there has been research that's shown there tends to be underreporting bias in this measure, particularly for men. Um, in our research, we use the Caseness score, which collapses the, the responses to a binary for each question and then sums the score over 12 questions. So on this slide here, I've included some of the factors affecting well-being that may have been relevant in the pandemic. I'm just going to spend a, a couple of minutes now going through each one. Um, if we start at the top with access to healthcare, so we know the healthcare system has been impacted by the pandemic. The period of this study is restricted to what we're calling the first wave of COVID in England. So that was kind of March through to July. And during this time, the highly infectious nature of the virus meant there were significant organisational changes for the healthcare services. There was a study released that looked at diabetes, COPD and hypertension, and it showed that because of the resource reallocation from chronic disease to COVID, there was quite a significant disruption in the continuity and the quality of care for these other diseases. In England, uh, elective surgeries and outpatient clinics were cancelled or postponed. And there was a big move to teleconsulting. And in the earlier stages, demand for respiratory care caused a knock-on effect in resourcing. So, you know, there were other restrictions to specialist services. And there has been some reports that conditions like cancer, we may see things like 3,000 excess deaths in the next five years as a result of delayed diagnoses. And the availability of healthcare also impacts on those with chronic or long-term conditions. So people with long-term conditions may not have been able to access their normal healthcare setting or service. And actually social engagement and access to information services, such as support groups, is, is part of the ongoing self-management for people who live with these types of illnesses. Uh, self-management, physical, mental health, they're all supported by social involvement with groups. And in some cases, these networks can even substitute for formalized healthcare but of course, these social networks have been significantly disrupted by the pandemic. And that leads me on to the next factor, which is social isolation. So just at the time when patients might have been unable to access healthcare and need to draw upon their social network for support, access to groups, socialising and even spending time with friends and family were all heavily restricted. And it was worse for those with significant comorbidities because they were instructed to shield. So loneliness has been shown to be associated with well-being for people with and without disabilities. But there may also have been an additional impact of the breakdown of any network care for those types of people. Having a risk factor for COVID-19 has been particularly stressful during the pandemic. And this may have played into the other factors affecting, the other factors affecting well-being. It's really stressful to be aware that you are in a high risk group. Shielders were very isolated during the first wave. And this also impacts on job security and finances and the range of other factors that we're coming to. Uh, 
Next up on my diagram is age. We know that age is a risk for severe COVID disease. We know that older people were instructed to shield. And we also know this older population is more likely to be faced with management of long-term conditions and loneliness. And there's also evidence that was gathered from the SARS outbreak in 2003 that there was a, a real increase in suicides in the 65 plus age group. And the research there concluded that social disengagement and mental stress, anxiety and fear of being a burden were all big factors in that decline in well-being. The next few items all relate to the change in the economic situation around the lockdown. So we've included financial stress, either through a loss of work or reduction of paid hours or furlough, the increase in the unpaid work burden. Here I'm talking about homeschooling or caring, both of which have really impacted people's well-being, either through having to work at the same time or having to stop working or just a general change in their work conditions and job security, whether that's working from home or having to conduct your normal way of working differently. Community and organisational resilience are the final two on this slide. There are organisations on which we depend, so this might be because of health needs, but there's also things that we use for health well-being, such as social groups or sports clubs, and how resilient those organisations have been to the pandemic can be impactful. And finally, community, living in a community that's supportive may influence how people have coped with day-to-day -day life, and in the face of the lockdown, this, this might be more important than ever. We used the Understanding Society COVID survey. At the time that we did this work, the later waves weren't published. So we used the first four waves and these broadly correspond to the first wave of the pandemic in England. Uh, data were collected April, May, June and July. By July, there was some reopening of the economy, although still subject to social distancing and mask wearing and so on. We selected only English cases because we wanted to look at deprivation and we used the IMD, which is place based. So we can't compare between countries within the UK. And we included only respondents who had replied to all four waves of data collection and who were contained in the baseline data, which was wave nine, the latest data available from the main study at the time of the work. We only looked at over 18. So this is just a study that looks at adults and we only considered online responses. Age, sex and the baseline score from wave nine were predictors of response. So the missing data is not random here. Uh, the response rate was just over 20% when we looked at the longitudinal response across the four data waves that we used. You can see here, just getting a little bit more into who did and didn't respond. Um, you can see here from this plot, there's a skew in the age of respondents. So the mean respondent age is 55 years compared with 49.1 for the main survey. And you can see also that there is a skew in the deprivation decile. So we used the LSOA of each respondent to impute the decile. And you can see, you know, we've got much more, many more people in the higher deciles, which is the least poor backgrounds. Females were more likely to respond. Uh, so the data is again skewed towards female sex. Um, and there were only 786 non-white valid English cases within the data set, which is 9.4%. And that compares with the underlying rate of 20% in the main survey. So there's some underrepresentation here, but it's not something we've been able to investigate as part of this work. The method is fairly straightforward. Uh, we fitted a number of models using an ordinary least square regression in Python, using the stats models library. Uh, we noticed a feature in the data that there was a decline in well-being that is to say the score went up and then a corresponding recovery. So we decomposed this into two separate phases, decline and the recovery and model them separately. And we also ran separate models for men and women based on the literature around different reporting behaviors. And this approach has been confirmed by a couple of papers that have been published on the same data recently in Lancet Psychiatry by another team. As I said, on the methods slide, we ran two models, one for decline and recovery. We included the baseline caseless score in both models and for the recovery we also included the decline in the caseless score for each individual. And we included sex and age, a binary variable to capture whether or not the person had a long-term health condition and responses to the loneliness module of the COVID data collection. We used food bank use as a proxy for the experience of an acute financial crisis and we coded income change based on equivalized household income to indicate worsening or improving financial situation over the period of the decline or recovery. And community cohesion was coded from questions in the survey. 
here you can see the trajectory of the well-being score. So just remembering that a higher score is poorer well-being. So we can see that males and females followed the same trajectory through the lockdown, but that women fell further from a higher baseline score and then recovered by a similar amount, whereas the men had a less steep decline in recovery, but from a lower baseline. So the next few slides show the models for the decline in the recovery. And you can see here we've got, I've, I've indicated statistical significance uh, by an asterisk. And we've got that across a number of variables. And here in this model, you can see we've got just a, around about 38% of variance explained. But actually, when I further in investigated it, we discovered that for both the decline and the recovery, the only things that really mattered were the baseline and loneliness variables. So the next slide shows the model for decline with the extra variables taken out. And you can see we've still got almost the same R squared value. So just to explain it a little bit more, uh, what we're seeing here is the change in the GHQ caseness score between wave nine and the eight pool measurement. And this model shows there's an association between the baseline score and loneliness. So if you had a higher baseline score to start with, your decline was less. But if you experienced loneliness, then your decline was much greater. If we look at the recovery and we can see we've got really similar effects. Again, no effects seen here for deprivation and no effect seen here for having a long-term condition. And that was the same across all of the models. And moving on to this slide, you can see yet again, most of the variance is explained by the baselines and loneliness. So the baseline score is important. The amount of the decline is important for the recovery. And again, loneliness is important. And this loneliness variable was slightly different to the one in the decline uh, because we summed it over the waves to try and capture some difference between people who experienced loneliness sometimes and some people who experienced persistent loneliness throughout the course of the pandemic. So well-being declined at the beginning of the lockdown and it recovered as the restrictions were lifted almost back to the baseline. The differences we expected to see uh, between groups who were more, more deprived or people who had long-term health conditions, we, we didn't see those. And you know, deprivation showed no association with well-being. This has confirmed other, week in the field, other work in the field. So what does this actually mean for people and how they've experienced the pandemic and how their well-being has responded to that? Well, experiencing loneliness was predictive of decreasing well-being and experiencing continued loneliness seemed to have resulted in people recovering less well as the pandemic progressed. The difference between people who are and aren't lonely may indicate differences in the way that some people experience the loosening of the lockdown. So some people chose to remain isolated after concern for their health or because of shielding advice, whereas others made the most of the new freedoms. One of the most interesting findings here was that the social gradient, which is, is well known to exist in health inequality, doesn't seem to be detectable here. It's really interesting because it means that our initial hypothesis about deprivation effects is, is not supported by the study. And it may be due to an overriding community effect present at the national level during the first wave of the pandemic. So more affluent people were perhaps less resilient to the impact of the pandemic as we might expect, or possibly poorer communities were, were more resilient to the lockdowns. We did look at community cohesion, but we found very little evidence to support it being important for the well-being for this sample. It showed a, a weak effect in women, but only for the decline and no effect in the recovery. And this might be because it's either, it's either not important or it might be that actually in the first lockdown, there was such a strong national narrative and rhetoric that the cultural environment of resilience may have been protective at a national level, and that might have overridden any more localised effects. Just one more minute left, Jen. Oh, the results here, you know, they're, they're interesting and slightly counterintuitive. We found no evidence of a social gradient, although mental health certainly suffered during the first lockdown. For this sample, well-being was shown to be highly elastic and it indicates a national level of resilience which is cut across the usually observed health inequalities. Really, we need to have more research to target the groups who are underrepresented, but the study does suggest that na national efforts to raise the spirits may well in this context have been useful. And, and really, actually, the best thing that we can do in terms of policy for raising people's well-being is to mitigate against the pandemic and ensure that we can allow people to return to their normal social life. I would be really interested to have seen the same data collection from the second lockdowns because certainly anecdotally, it, it seems to feel a lot worse. So I have rattled through that in the interest of time, um, but thank you very much for listening. Okay, thanks, Jen. Um, so the next speaker is Sarah Seeger.
So this is about tapping into the world's largest observational research network with the OHDSI community. So Sarah has 20 years, over 20 years experience across the UK health sector, specialising in healthcare analytics, statistics and informatics. She conducted large scale public health analytics within the NHS and designed and implemented data lakes and the creation of a new data science function for one of the largest UK private medical insurance companies. She joined the Observational Health Data Science community in 2018 and is an active member of various OHDSI working groups as well as the OHDSI steering committee. Um, your main areas of expertise are statistical data analysis, geospatial analysis, data visualization, data science methodologist, lots of others. And lots of things. And oh, she's yeah. a certified ethical hacker as well. I am, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, fire away then you've got 15 minutes I'll give perfect. you a two minute warning and you can um, see my slideshow yeah perfect perfect fantastic okay um yeah thanks everyone for joining um so I'm going to just sort of briefly walk through sort of what is Odyssey um as it as it's pronounced so Odyssey is the um, Observational Health Data Sciences and Informatics um, program. It's a, a complete open network. Um, so although I work for IQVIA, um, we are also part of um, this open community, uh, which contains multiple stakeholders, interdisciplinary, collaborative. Um, and essentially, the idea is to sort of create um, open source solutions that bring out the value of observational health data through large scale analytics. So you can see that there's um, a number of different uh, collaborators from across the world um, and they range from academia uh, through government, um, pharma, hospitals, payer, provider, everyone, anyone um, can join this open um, community uh, for the sake of doing global research and and really the premise of this is around standardization. Um, as I mentioned, this is public, it's open, it's not funded by pharma, it's completely uh, international um, and anyone can be part of this. Even if you don't have data um, and you're wishing just to partake in research, you can be part of this community and get involved. And so the what we call the Odyssey Network. Um, we've got a, a number of collaborators, as I mentioned, we've got lots of um, different organizations involved. This slide, just to give you an idea of sort of who we have, who are active at the moment. Um, we've got lots of emerging collaborators who are coming on board. Um, and there's also obviously a lot who are intending to come and join. So as I said, it's completely open. Um, it's a great community, very global. So, but OMOP. OK, so Odyssey and OMOP, they're kind of two terms that are used sort of, you know, uh, together in synchronous. Um, so Odyssey is a community um, and OMOP, which stands for Observational Medical Outcomes Partnership, is essentially the, the, the common data model. And so what Odyssey, the, the community have done is that they have actually created a standardised and harmonised common data model. And everyone who is part of this um, Odyssey community either has data, that they have converted themselves to OMOP, or they are, or they, they may not even have data. They may just wish to, wish to want to sort of, you know, get involved in the research. But what does that mean? So, essentially, for those that do have data, so for myself, I work for a large organisation who, which is very, very data rich and has lots of different data sources and data types. Um, but we have lots of raw data. So we, for example, even, even in my own role, I have you know, access to US claims data, to uh, UK primary care data, to um, European hospital data. But all of it, as you can imagine, is very, very different. They have their different systems, their different sources. Um, and if you think about plugs, um, this is one of our favorite slides, whether you like it or not. Um, you know, you go to a different country, there's different sockets, you know, how do you know you've got the right converter? And then when thinking about the analysis, it's like, okay, so as a researcher, how can I do global research if all of the data is very, very different? Let's forget about the access for just now, but all of the data is different. So, you know, how do I go about even thinking about adherence to a particular drug? Or how do I go about doing a health needs assessment um, around a particular condition or therapeutic area. Well, what 
um, OMOP does is that because it takes the raw data and converts and standardizes that, you then have this global set of what we call OMOP data. Um, and so no matter what the data um, in its raw um, native source looks like or where it comes from or in what language or what country, it will technically look exactly the same. And that therefore means we can then come along and actually do global research. And so just sort of um, briefly, just to go around sort of the common data model, I won't go into too much sort of technical detail because um, I want to get to the COVID stuff. Um, but really the, 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 the CDM, common data model, it's a patient centric model. Um, it's based on a sort of a relational uh, database construct. Um, and so within this, um, all of the tables, all of the fields for no matter what data that you have are converted. Now, as part of the community, you have people who can help you do this or they are um, on the Odyssey website. Anyone can go and do this themselves. Um, so uh, from the, the data aspect, the, the tables um, are in this sort of standardized way. Um, and no matter whether it's a, a health survey or electronic health records, it's still able to um, sort of form this construct. Now, it's not just about the data. It's all about the vocabularies or clinical coding or ontologies or however you want to describe it. Um, you can tell that I work for global teams. There's lots of different terminologies for the same thing. Um, essentially, they're, they're all uh, different, all various um, across all the different systems and all clinical events in the OMOP common data model expressed as concepts. So uh, we've got drugs, conditions, procedures, measurements, um, and essentially all of these are then standardized themselves as well. So as you can imagine, this is a, a huge task in itself. I mean, clinical coding on its own is, is huge, but when looking at global data, um, this is also something that's taken into consideration as well. Now with OMOP, um, it's not just the data, it's not just the vocabulary, it's also the analytics, the data science as well that is standardized. So the open community, Odyssey community, they've even designed um, specific R libraries that allow researchers uh, to conduct common types of analytics, which for the COVID examples, which I will come to very shortly, um, meant that we were able to do, um, or at least start working on these COVID studies very, very quickly and very, very efficiently because a lot of the sort of pre-canned analytics and codings were there already available for anyone to actually obtain themselves and, and put within their own environment. Now, what Odyssey does um, and, and what I do on a day-to-day on -day basis, is we work in this sort of research network environment. So that I, I wanted to use this one to give you an example of how that would work. So um, for, so I, I'm down the bottom in IQVIA, we have lots of data and we act as a coordinating centre, co coordinating center, put my teeth in. And we have lots of data all converted to OMOP, but what we, um, as part of OMOP, the brilliant thing is that to do global research, you do not need to access anyone's data. No one will ever access your data. All that is done is um, the analytical code um, is created by the coordinating center or whoever. Um, and it's just that analytical code that is then shared to anyone within that work network, to anyone that's external, to anyone that's in the Odyssey group. They then take that code, run that against their data, assuming they have data, and then it's just aggregated results are sent back. And then the coordinating center would just then compile all of these insights. And before you know it, you've had or you've completed um, a global uh, research study. So as you can uh, imagine, it sort of, you know, mitigates the need for, you know, kind of data governance and security and privacy because no data is ever being shared. You don't have to worry about firewalls. It is just um, the actual analytical code, the cohorts that you are creating as part of your research. And that's what's being shared. So I wanted to give you that context because then when I go on to sort of the, the COVID, it gives you an idea of how it was actually done. So I'll get to the exciting bit. So uh, as part of the, um, uh, well, because of the pandemic, um, it, for us it, and the Odyssey community, it brought the opportunity to do an awful lot of COVID research. Um, and so back in March of last year, um, there was a huge study-a-thon, as we call them, and it was open up to the entire 
Odyssey community. So to all 2,500, 3,000 collaborators, um, everyone was able, should they wish, to, to join this study a thon. And the idea was that there were sort of three research focuses. So the main one was really around characterization. And this project was called Charybdis. <clears throat> um, and that stands for characterizing health associated risks and your baseline disease in SARS-CoV-2. Um, and essentially that was around sort of analyzing, um, it was an in-depth study of COVID-19 um, and other viral disease populations. So for example, we looked at um, adults that were hospitalized with influenza back in 2009 to 2010. We looked at flu seasons as well back in 2014, um, compared to adults who were hospitalized and tested positive or had a diagnose or who were diagnosed with SARS. Um, we also did a, a prediction model. Um, so this study is aimed at uh, flattening the curve um, by understanding individual risk for COVID-19 outcomes um, across the international network. Uh, we also validated existing models um, really to try and understand, you know, who will utilize um, intensive care or intensive services, depending on sort of what part of the world you come from. And then the third one was um, what we call an effect estimation. So this is um, a pharmaco epi study testing the effectiveness and safety for treatment um, of prophylactic use. Um, so for example, uh, hydroxychloroquine, took me a while to uh, learn how to say that, um, either alone or in conjunction with um, azithromycin. So just to give you a uh, an idea of what this study thon study -a -thon looked like. Um, so it was run um, across a period of 88 hours um, so that it could cover all time zones. So it was almost like a um, an 88 hour machine. So we had everyone from uh, from Europe and then uh, they were joined by those guys in the US. And then as they went to sleep, the guys in um, Asia Pacific joined. Um, so it was a, a real great um, global event. Um, over, I think, 30 countries were involved. Um, there were lots of what we call sort of global huddles, so sort of little work streams. So one team would go off and work on how to um, design the phenotype. Um, others would go and work on, say, with the data validation of those that had data and were contributing to the study of thon There was a whole range of different work streams, even to the point of literature reviews and what else was um, available. Um, it also resulted in a number of publications, which um, there are quite a few links within this PowerPoint, so you can actually um, catch those later on. And there were some uh, actual study packages, so 13 different study packages. And what that means is that on the Odyssey website, you can go and actually utilize those study packages right now and um, start to see what the uh, concepts were used, how the cohorts were built, uh, what populations they were looking at. Um, it was just it was just a truly fantastic uh, study thon, but it's still continuing to this day because obviously data is refreshed and constant. Um, and so it's. It, I think it was one of our sort of more prestigious events that we had. Um, minutes, and also, uh... yes, okay, cool. Um, and then I'm thinking about some of the results. So um, I won't go through all of them because um, I added quite a few slides at the end, but I thought you guys can do a little bit of bedtime reading. Um, mm -hmm. And they also link to the publications themselves. So you can always do a bit of research there. But essentially, um, so Charybdis, um, uh, you will see at the bottom here, there is a link to a shiny app. Um, you can go to that link right now and it's an interactive dashboard where you can see all of the results from this um, study around um, from the different providers that partook it, uh, took part in it. Um, but essentially some of the highlights, I'll go real quick. Um, so for this particular um, publication, uh, the main highlight from this was around how obesity was more common um, amongst uh, COVID-19 patients compared to the influenza patients um, and that obese patients presented more severe forms of COVID-19 with higher levels of hospitalization. And then there was another publication um, which looked at multiple medicines that were used in the first months of the COVID-19 pandemic. So bearing in mind, this is global so that, you know, you can just understand and get a sense of the variety of the different geographies that were involved. Um, we also have, I think there's probably about another 10 or so slides, but as I said, you can go and really, you know, get to grips into the detail a little bit more. Um, but again, we looked at comorbidities um, and the prevalence of those with those um, patients who were hospitalized. Um, 
multiple medications used to treat pregnant women um, and whether they had um, any benefits from that. Um, the, the results go on. As, a, as I say, the study of Thon was really quite huge. Charybdis on its own, which is the characterization, we're just looking into the disease factors of COVID-19. There are so many different angles, uh, so many different nuances that um, there's quite a bit of uh, sort of reading um, and some results to sort of uh, get your head around, which is great. Um, how am I doing for time? Am I nearly there? At the uh, end? You're, you're just about over, but you can okay. carry on. At, we've got a bit of leeway, so you can carry okay. on. Okay, yeah, minutes. I'll just sort of flick through them quickly. I'll just yeah. go through sort of the highlight section. Um, so again, this is still Charybdis. Um, so this was looking at the uh, the different uh, testing practices um, uh, led to the baseline characteristics, outcomes. Um, the, it just really showed the importance of large scale characterization of something like COVID-19, which can really help with informing planning and resource allocation uh, across multiple countries, multiple health systems. Um, so here we looked at um, HIV and COVID-19 co-infected patients and um, essentially we found that across um, the different uh, care settings, you know, co-infected patients who received intensive services or intensive care uh, were more likely to have more serious underlying disease or a history of more serious events um, compared to those who were diagnosed with uh, COVID-19. And then we have a few others. So still some more results around uh, Charybdis. I do have some other results. Um, let me move to the, uh, so from the population level effective estimation. So here we looked at the short term use of uh, hydroxychloroquine because that was a huge thing in the news at one point. Um, and then there's also some results around if I get to this one, the patient level prediction. So we looked at seven predictors. So whether the patients had a history of cancer, COPD, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, hyperlipidemia and kidney disease. Um, and then combined that with an age and sex um, discrimination, which uh, then allowed us to sort of experience really the different outcomes. Again, this is another shiny app. You can go and play with this. It's rather a, a fantastic one, to be honest, from a, a geeky point of view. You can change the different variables variables and, and really get to grips with the data without even having to even own or access the data or even ask for permission because again OMOP Odyssey is about aggregated results um, and so it, it means we can sort of do an awful lot of sharing and not have to worry too much about patient sensitivities and things like that so um, I'll leave that there for now but please do go and read um, you know this PowerPoint a bit more there's more links in there and I've gone sort of super quick super high level but um, there's lots of um, as I said applications to go and play with as well as read. John is head of data within the ONS health analysis team he has expertise in health data sharing across government departments and his team are responsible for the processing and curation of the civil registration data that ONS receive from the General Register Office for Statistical Purposes. Previously, he's worked in several government departments in a range of analytical roles, including military, Ministry of Defence, DEFRA, and the Cabinet Office. And Vahi, who is going to be speaking, is a principal statistician at the Office for National Statistics, leading the Health Modelling Hub in the Health Analysis Division. He's also a research fellow at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, working in the Population Health Innovation Lab, where he moved after obtaining a PhD in economics at King's College London. And his current research interests include estimating the health effects of social policies and studying health inequalities. So over to you, Vahi. OK, so I'm going to talk you through um, an innovative data set that we've built during the pandemic to help with the policy response called a public health data asset. So the, clearly the pandemic uh, increased the need for timely evidence to monitor uh, at the beginning the differential impact of COVID-19, the inequalities in mortality, and still does to an extent for instance, monitoring the inequality in vaccine uptake and, and uh, in infection. And this highlighted really the importance of uh, having population level data that you can use to look at inequality. Because, for instance, mortality is a relatively rare outcome, and if you want to look at mortality in small groups, then you really need what you really need to do is to get is population level data set. Because even a survey, uh, uh, even a large survey, would be difficult to use to look at small small groups. Uh, 
the limitation of existing data sources so that on one hand you had the electronic health records uh, that are really good because they are population level data sets but they tend to be relatively limited in terms of uh, social demographic characteristics that are included. Yeah. On the other hand of the spectrum, you've got surveys which are very detailed, uh, cover a lot of different social demographic characteristics, but are of relatively uh, limited sample size, uh, uh, size and are also quite expensive to set up. So the UNS has done a good job at, I mean, I should say great, uh, at setting up the COVID infections survey. Uh, which is about a survey about 500,000 people are followed monthly. And this has been crucial, but this is very expensive and relatively, it took quite a while to set up, even though it was done at incredible pace. So what we did at the beginning of the pandemic is to try to, is to create a new data source linking the census to electronic health records and mortality data. And so that's what we call the ONS public health data asset. So it's a new uh, population level data set designed to enable analysts and researchers to uh, conduct public health research using data from multiple sources. So it's still a, an, involving, uh, an evolving product and it's been uh, going through several phases, but at the core of it is a 2011 census, which was linked to, uh, to the National uh, Health Service Patient Register to obtain an NHS number with a linkage rate of about 95%. And then that allows this linkage to the uh, patient register has allowed us to link to different uh, data, data assets from the from the ONS, so the DES data, but also from uh, other government departments, in, in, including NHS Digital. So we've got the linkage to, uh, most importantly, to the GP data so from the, the that was done by NHS Digital. So that's all primary care records for patients that were alive and active and living in England in November 2019. And also to a wide range of data sets, so the uh, hospital statistics, the uh, test and trace data, the vaccination data, so on and so forth. So that's been made possible by getting the NHS number attached to the census. So what it covers, so it's uh, it basically what, what the NHS public health data set cover is basically the intersection between the census and the GPS data. So it's everybody who were enumerated at the 2011 census and were still uh, resident in England in 2019 and alive. So it does exclude quite a few people. So it excludes uh, recent migrants, new births as well, uh, by, by, by construction. And also it excludes people who are not registered with the NHS um, or people, of course, who have moved away. And that's a good thing, they're excluded. So in terms of coverage, what, what's in, in this data set? So we've got data on about 40 million people, age nine plus, that were alive at the beginning of the pandemic. And as you can see on the bottom right, We've got a coverage of nine plus of about seventy nine percent, and what is interesting, what is in interesting, is that the coverage improves for older, is higher for older age groups. That reflects that the linkage rate between the census and the patient register was higher was higher for uh, older people. So that we cover about ninety percent of sixty five plus, which is for this pandemic is, is is important because of people that were more severely affected were the elderly. And then in terms of what we have in the data sets, we've got a wide range of uh, social demographic characteristics. So we've got obviously ethnicity, which is self-reported, unlike in the electronic health records. We also have religion, uh, main language, and a wide range of cultural factors. We also have uh, some, some social demographic characteristics, some socioeconomic characteristics, so household deprivation, uh, the tenure, and the household composition. We also have some occupational exposure. So Obviously, the, the main limitation is that it's uh, data that were collected uh, nine years ago. But for the geographical factor, of, uh, when we, we, we could uh, link this to a more recent uh, patient register, so to update all the geographical information. And we also derived uh, a medical history following the, the QCOVID risk model, uh, the medical history that was used to build that model. So we, we cover a wide range of, of, uh, of uh, severe conditions and less severe that were all associated with COVID-19 mortality. In terms of outcome, uh, I should have updated this a bit now. We've got the mortality hospitalization uh, for COVID-19, but also we've just acquired the test and trace data and to, to look at infection uh, positivity. And also we have linked uh, vaccination data. So now we can look at vaccination as an outcome. And so the data can be accessed now, it's most of it, not, not the vaccination data yet, uh, via the secure research service. Uh, 
Uh, and I've put some links here for, for you to to uh, to use uh, after uh, if you're interested. Uh, we we have had our first uh, researchers accessing the data a few few weeks ago, so it's it's now up and running and all set up for for researchers to use. So in terms of work, so we've done quite a lot of work uh, on. Um, uh, so here is a summary of some of the work we've done, and I'm going to go into uh, some more detail in this presentation. We've done a lot, a lot of work on inequalities in COVID-19 mortality, so by ethnicity, by religion, uh, also to do some work on household composition. And we've done a, a validation of a prediction model, the Q-COVID risk model, which is a model that is used uh, that was used as a result of this validation for the population uh, risk assessment and to, was used uh, ultimately to update the shielding list that was used for informing the prioritization of a vaccination campaign. And we are doing, we have a work program on, uh, on long COVID and looking at uh, the post COVID syndrome. And we've done also some, we've got an emerging work program on, on vaccination. So on uptake and also on effectiveness. So I'm going to ma mainly focus on the work we've done on ethnicity because that was the first piece of work we did. And also on the post COVID syndrome work that we, we, we conducted. So at the beginning of the pandemic, there was some early signals uh, of an unequal impact of the pandemic on on, uh, on several uh, ethnic minority groups. But there was uh, no way to measure this directly using just mortality records because ethnicity is not collected in, in, on the death certificate. So what we did was uh, exploiting this the new uh, linked census to mortality records that we had developed just before the pandemic to estimate the difference in COVID-19 mortality between ethnic groups. So what we did was first just adjusting for age to look at uh, the raw like, type of inequality, and then trying to exploit the characteristic from the census to try to understand these inequalities and understand why do we observe these uh, differences. And finally, we also did some work trying to look at how the lockdown affected these differences. So did the lockdown reduce or increase the inequalities? That's the question we, we answered. So. Uh, very briefly, so that's our kind of main results. So that's for wave one, the desk. Cover. So that was just for the first wave. We've since then updated it, but that's uh, that was our first uh, publication. So that looks at the relative difference in COVID 19 mortality between several ethnic minority groups and the uh, white uh, ethnic groups. And, and it shows the result, the hazard ratios for different models. So uh, on green, adjusted for age and then ad sequentially adjusted for several different factors to look at how the differences change when you adjust for, for different factors. So what we can see is that the differences were massive. Uh, I mean, uh, up to three times more likely to die for uh, black men were three times more likely to die than uh, white men. And it was about 2.5 for Bangladeshi people from Bangladesh and Pakistan background and, and very raised risk as well for female and for all, all the groups. And here, I mean, we usually when we look at inequality in health, uh, you know, when a hazard ratio of 1.5 is, is deemed as really large, and here it's far be far beyond, far above and beyond what you know has previously been documented for other disease, and that reflects to an extent that it is an infectious disease, and that's very different from a non-communicable disease, because once we we found that uh, adjusting for uh, population density and local authority districts so for geographic factor that really decreased the estimated differences in mortality. And that suggests that a lot of the diff of, of the inequalities were driven by geography. So the, the pandemic the hit so, some uh, uh, like larger city, lo larger urban areas, more densely populated areas, uh, more quickly in the first wave. And so that ex accounted for about fifty to sixty percent of the differences uh, were accounted by geography. Uh, and then adjusting further for different measures of social demographic characteristics did reduce uh, a bit further the, the uh, hazard ratios. And for instance, if you look for um, the hazard ratio for F Bangladeshi and Pakistani female, once you've adjusted for uh, all the characteristics in, our, in the census, then you find no differences anymore. So this suggests that it, it, all the differences are explained by the factors included in our model. So this is go against uh, the theory at the beginning that the differences were driven by uh, uh, differences in fatality rates, that the, the virus would be more uh, affecting some ethnic minority groups more severely, is just that the main reason why they were more likely to, to die is because they were more likely to be infected. That was confirmed later on uh, when using studies uh, of, of antibody prevalence, uh, the, the REACT2 study, that found that the, fat, the case fatality ratio between the groups were exactly the same. I'm sorry. 
So our second uh, analysis that we did on this was to look at the difference in, uh, in, in COVID-19 uh, mortality between ethnic groups uh, pre and post lockdown. And here, what we find is that the lockdown really attenuated the inequalities. Uh, so in green, it's the hazard ratio before lockdown and the fully adjusted uh, hazard ratio before lockdown and in, in yellow, it's after lockdown. And here we, we can see is clearly there's a massive reduction in inequalities uh, after the lockdown. So that shows that lockdown policy uh, not only helped reduce infection, but it also helped uh, reduce inequalities in, in exposure. So again, this is another indirect proof that the differences were primarily driven by infection rather than by uh, differences in severity. Because if it was just a severity of vitam like vitamin D or so, the other type of explanation, the lockdown shouldn't have made a difference or very little. So you had a wide uh, impact uh, so in the wide media coverage in the press um, when we released this uh, on the UNS website. And it also had a, a big policy impact with the UK government order, ordering a review uh, of the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on the, on the bank community. Also some sev several community-led interventions to try to raise awareness of the, of the risks. And uh, so we provided uh, regular updates and further analysis uh, for say, the SAGE ethnicity subgroup. And we also had a, a relatively big academic impact. So we published a lot of our work, uh, not only on the, the ONS website, but also in academic uh, peer review journals that helped uh, raise our profile and develop collaboration with, with some uh, leading academics in the field and obtain further funding for our work. Uh, so now I'm, just, I'm going to completely change topic and <laughs> tell you a bit more about the, the work we've done on the epidemiology of the, of the post-COVID uh, syndrome. So this is not a single condition, but it's more uh, a, a wide range of signs and symptoms that, uh, as, as said, as defined by NICE, that develop during or following an infection consistent with COVID-19, which continue for more than 12 weeks and are not explained by an alternative diagnosis. So that's the official definition. And so what, what, what was known when we started the study that there was a high uh, post-discharge mortality and readmission amongst individuals uh, that, were, that had been hospitalized with COVID-19. But there was less evidence about the, uh, the, da the damage on, on uh, the, the, the consequences on, uh, on, on morbidity. And what we did is to estimate the rates of post-discharge diagnosis of respiratory, cardiovascular, metabolic, kidney, and liver disease. And we used a, a matched patients as a control group to, to try to identify the kind of causal effect of, in, of being hospitalized for COVID-19. So what our setup was to use, uh, so we focused on our, our group of interest was patients hospitalized with COVID-19 that had been discharged by August 2020. And we did a one-to-one -one matching uh, based on demographics and a 10 year history of comorbidities to get a control group. And then we looked at outcome in the hospital episode statistics and in the primary care. The matching, so the matching variables, we used age, sex, ethnicity, region, IMD, quinta, smoking status, and several uh, pre-existing conditions, so hypertension, uh, major adverse uh, cardiovascular events and respiratory disease, etc. Hi, Farhi, you've got yeah. two, minute, two minutes left. Two minutes, perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll go quickly to uh, the main um, Graph. So here it shows the, uh, the rate per thousand patient years of adverse events in discharge patients in England uh, com compared to with match control. So in in, uh, in dark blue you've got the people who've been hospitalized with COVID-19, and in light blue that's the rate for the control group. So that's kind of the the rates of uh, events that you would have expected for that particular group if they had not been admitted to hospital. So we can see a raised risk of all events uh, we looked at, the so diabetes, uh, major adverse cardiovascular events, uh, chronic kidney disease and chronic uh, liver disease. And we find a raised risk, not only for uh, uh, diagnosis of, of, of uh, di new diagnosis, but also for new diagnosis of people when previously not being diagnosed. That's what is shown on the right uh, panel, is new diagnosis of people who in the last 10 years have not been diagnosed with diabetes or, or had not experienced major adverse cardiovascular events or chronic kidney disease or chronic liver disease. So we, we find a yeah, lar large increase uh, so that suggesting that there would be quite a big uh, burden uh, on the NHS uh, for all the, uh, so here it's really looking at the, uh, the most severely affected patient because patient in hospital. So we do have a work program looking at uh, uh, trying to replicate this in the population of uh, just infected population, not, not just the people who have been hospitalized. <clears throat> 
and with our data, we're also uh, able to look at the differences in uh, relative risks, different groups of developing uh, uh, different conditions. So you can see that, I mean, in absolute risk, of course, uh, pe uh, people aged 70 plus who had been admitted to hospital at a higher mortality rate than younger people, but in relative risk, the relative risk was much greater among younger people. And it's uh, found consistently for all the disease that younger people who've been admitted to hospital had a much uh, greater uh, like probability or risk of developing uh, different conditions than uh, older people. We also we found interestingly very little difference between men and female, but we find a slightly uh, raised risk for a non-white uh, non-white population in, in, again in relative risk. So in terms of impact, this study was published in the BMJ and it was presented at several events uh, to medical practitioners and at BMJ webinar. And also it's been part, uh, presented as part of a long, long COVID training event. It's been used extensively uh, in, in the academic literature and uh, as well as in the NIHR's review of international evidence for, for long COVID. And it's been uh, used uh, uh, to brief uh, uh, Matt Hancock and uh, Chris Whitty, as well as a prime, prime minister. Okay, I'm going to stop here uh, and I'm happy to take any, any question. I had another slide on the uh, vaccine uptake, but I think I'll let you, uh, I'll share the slide afterwards uh, anyway. Thank okay, you very much. thank you. If you just got one more slide, Vahi, you can, you could show that. We do have extra time. Oh, okay, good. So, I mean, it was just uh, the study we did on vaccination coverage by social demographic characteristics with the, uh, with the NIMS linkage to the NIMS data. So what we did was to link the vaccination data to the uh, to our public health data assets, and we achieved the linkage rate for the 50 plus of 86 uh, percent. So it means that 86 percent of people who have been vaccinated, we managed to find them in our data set, and that's relatively consistent with the uh, coverage figure I've shown you uh, at the beginning. And we did two things to so just estimate the coverage rates by social demographic characteristics. So we looked at ethnicity, religion, measure of uh, household tenure. Uh, education, a uh, wide range of measures that we had, uh, main language, etc. And we also produced some uh, odd ratios of not being vaccinated to try to understand a bit better, a bit more the, the inequalities in, in uh, vaccine coverage. So I've just got the results for the, uh, the ethnicity. So what we highlighted was massive differences in terms of coverage in adult uh, 50 plus. So that was by, I think, mid-May, but the, stock, the picture hasn't changed much. So we could see that uh, over 90% of our People from age 50 plus uh, were from the white British ethnic group had been uh, vaccinated and it was much lower in other groups, such as uh, especially in among black Caribbean and, and black African, as well as uh, Pakistani and, and, uh, and uh, other groups as well. So yeah, massive differences. And these uh, uh, interestingly were not really explained, they were explained to some extent by social demographic characteristics as shown on the right. Uh, uh, with a graph, but it remained massively raised risk uh, of not being vaccinated. So for the Black Caribbeans, it remained more than 5.5 times a greater odds of not being vaccinated after we adjusted for all the, all the social demographic characteristics and medical conditions. So this highlighted the really uh, probably uh, you know, like the cultural factors played big roles, things that we don't measure in our data and behaviors. So that, that was quite impactful in trying to uh, set up new initiatives to uh, increase the uptake in these groups. Okay, so put the link to the, to the publication as well. Okay, that's all for me. Thank you very much. So the next speaker is Catherine or Katie Saunders, um, and she's going to be talking about inequalities in access to primary care experienced by people with multiple morbidities during the COVID pandemic. So so Katie is a statistician working in the primary care unit in the Department of Public Health and Primary Care at the University of Cambridge. And this work was carried out as part of a project carried out by the Birmingham Rand and Cambridge Evaluation or BRACE Centre, which is funded by the National Institute for Health Research to conduct rapid evaluations of new services and innovations in health and social care. So, um, yeah, hi, my name is Katie Sons. I'm from the University of Cambridge. I'm talking about some work I did as part of BRACE, um, looking at the, which is um, a rapid evaluation centre, um, evaluating um, innovation, service innovations within the NHS. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about the work I've done. We've been doing, looking at the impact of the introduction of telephone triage in primary care, um, both before and during COVID-19, um, with particular focus of 
inequalities in access experience by people with multiple long-term conditions. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of context, talk a little bit about the methods, the results, the discussion, and some reflections, but please do jump in with thoughts. Um, it's still work in progress. So telephone triage. Telephone triage is when you call your GP and you either speak to them straight away on the telephone or you wait for them to call you back. Then the issue is either dealt with on the phone or you're invited into the surgery for an appointment. So telephone triage kind of pre-2020, pre-pandemic was designed within the context of an increasing primary care workload with, with um, the shift in kind of the management of long-term health conditions having moved mainly from secondary care to mainly primary care and, and the ageing population, so an increased need for management of long-term health conditions kind of um, is the context in which this increasing workload for GPs um, is occurring and telephone triage which was designed as a tool to kind of to demand management, to, to manage the workload. Um, early, it's been evaluated um, for the, there were some early trials and then early evaluation using routine healthcare data. And it found in general, when telephone triage is implemented and introduced into GP practices, um, there's evidence of changes in process measures. People, patients speak to and speak to and see a GP more quickly than if a telephone triage approach isn't introduced kind of makes sense because the whole point of telephone triage is the day you need to see or speak to a GP you call up and you speak to them on the phone um, but it also found that there were more contacts with primary care um, so evaluations actually found that um, telephone triage doesn't reduce primary care workload it's not nor does it kind of save um, nor does it lead to cost savings either in primary care or in secondary care and and the final kind of big thing um, uh, the uh, our earlier evaluation of telephone triage found was that there's heterogeneity between practices. Actually, it's not the same for all GP practices. Uh, for some, it worked very well, but, but it's not kind of a magic bullet that's going to solve the problem of, of, um, of demand in prime, demand services in primary care. Um, so then we get COVID-19. So we kind of have this context of, of telephone triage as, as a service innovation in the NHS before COVID-19. And then with COVID-19 in March 2020, there was a sudden shift from mainly in-person consultations in primary care to mainly remote consultations. Um, here, the motivation was very firmly not demand management, kind of the purpose for which telephone triage had, had mainly been introduced, but, but health protection to reduce practice footfall, to reduce risk of COVID-19. It was also a bit messy. There was lots going on in kind of health services and um, at the start of COVID-19, um, lots of different models being introduced, lots of other changes going on at the same time. Context number four, this is ongoing research and it's really political. There's, um, I stopped trying to update the kind of political context for this research. Um, NHS England and the BMA are still discussing in the press and in, in letters, public letters to each other about the return to face-to-face -face consulting and how this is going to happen, how it's going to be implemented. So multimorbidity. It's a policy priority for NHS England. Um, multimorbidity being, being how, how to manage and plan health services for people living with more than one long-term health condition. Um, a lot of the kind of improvements in care and in clinical practice that we've seen in within the NHS over the last 20 years have come from kind of very guideline-driven approaches, kind of from evidence, from evidence that's been really kind of designed for patients with a single long-term condition. But, but many people are living with multiple long-term conditions. And so how to provide effective and efficient care for people living with, with multiple long-term conditions is kind of a, a priority. Um, so this was the kind of pre-COVID-19 context. And then the post, the COVID-19 context for this is actually um, multimorbidity remains a, a priority for health, serv for health services delivery and understanding how to plan health services because of the really strong variation in COVID-19 outcomes among people living with multiple long-term health conditions. And then there's kind of some more theoretical context as well. The selfie framework is the theoretical framework we've been thinking of this within the patient and their environmental kind of with the core of the framework, but then service innovations for people living with multiple long-term conditions are considered at the micro level, so the patient level, the MISA level, which might be the practice level, or kind of the national level, which might be the sudden implementation of telephone triage um, in 2020. Last bit of context, I'm, I'm nearly getting to the data, which is a good bit. Um, 
understanding the inequalities impact of service innovations from the NHS is actually fairly, really hard, particularly if you want to do kind of a, a nice quantitative inequalities analysis. Um, I, I say here on my slide, the intervention needs to work in the, the first place. So often service innovations are introduced and they have kind of qualitative or kind of research evidence about the intervention can find that really they've been doing a huge amount of that a lot's been going on, the intervention has been, been making a difference in how services delivered. But actually, when it comes to measuring quantitative outcomes, um, often there isn't evidence of a really big change in, in the outcome or in the measures we're interested in. Um, the, the sample size, the data, the sample size in the data set that you're using to evaluate inequalities impact has to be large enough. It's kind of as a statistician, it, it has to be at least four times. You're, you're testing for an interaction, not for a main effect. So you need to sample size about four times as large um, as you would for measuring a main effect. The data need to be available. Often, if you really want to measure the inequalities impact of, of a change, the outcome isn't measured or, or the groups you want to look at aren't measured in your data. They need to measure the characteristics of interest. And finally, there was a recent systematic review that was published at the start of 2021 and actually it highlighted that there's not a lot of evidence on the inequalities impact for, for the start of telephone, for, on, for telephone triage and remote consulting. So, so kind of this research comes into the context of wanting to understand how service innovations work for people living with multiple long-term conditions and kind of a data context where it was possible to do this inequalities, this inequalities analysis. Um, so, so yeah, so I said the kind of the, the research project comes into the context of where it's possible to address these methodological challenges, where often actually it's not possible to look at the inequalities impact of change. We looked at the time taken to see or speak to a GP. I mentioned this at the beginning with telephone triage. This is the thing that really changes when, when a GP practice switches to a telephone triage approach. Um, we looked in GPPS. It's the General Practice Patient Survey. It's an annual cross-sectional survey. Um, run by NHS England. It's designed to, to measure care quality in primary care. It's got a large sample size, about 100, 125 people from every GP practice in England. The data are, are available, or can, we apply for access from NHS England, and it measures multimorbidity. Uh, we also looked at post-COVID-19 in Understanding Society, Jen did this really nice introduction to that COVID-19 Understanding Society way. Again, looking at data on multimorbidity and primary care utilisation. And we asked, does introducing telephone triage mean people with multimorbidity see or speak to a GP soon? The analysis of GPPS, exploring data, we looked at 150 practices who'd switched to telephone triage between 2011 and 2017. And in Understanding Society, we looked um, at the we used the pre-COVID-19 data for some of the characteristics of participants, and we looked at monthly surveys, the six surveys from April to November 2020. Both have information on long-term conditions. We calculated weighted estimates using the, um, using the Understanding Society survey weights. So I'm Akis, my colleague from the Understanding Society course to understand, to make sure we were using the right weights, we used the GPPS weights as well. We used, in an adjusted analysis, adjusting for age, sex, ethnicity, deprivation in GPPS because it's English based on IMD and household quintiles of household income from equivalent quintiles of household income from understanding such using pre-pandemic data. We also adjusted for survey wave um, and for GP practice and with GPPS analysis. PPI at the bottom says um, we had patient and public involvement in this research. We had a we met with our PPI panel before the research started and said, what you really need to look at are people with hearing problems. So we looked at this group separately and we also met with them again with our results and talked through and to see what they kind of thought about. That. Measuring multimorbidity and both understanding society and GPPS. So it's a survey measure of long-term health conditions. Uh, in GPPS, it's a list of 15 conditions, including a long-term mental health problem in understanding society and the COVID waves. Um, uh, it's a 26 measure list. We created an ordinal measure of multimorbidity. So we counted up the number of long-term conditions, people that they were living with, not one, two, three, or four or more. For understanding society, we used the question which was asked in all six of the COVID waves, thinking about your situation now, have you been able to access the NHS services, GP or primary care, 
you need to help managing your condition over the last four weeks. With the response options to this question were in person, yes, online or by phone only. No, I wasn't able to access. No, we decided not to seek help at this time or not required. It was only asked to people with long-term health conditions or ongoing treatment from April to September. And in November, it was asked for everyone. So we adjusted for wave and analysis. And we did various analyses looking at what the impact of this change was, decided it was okay and kept all the data in. For this question, we recoded the responses into four binary outcome variables to look at whether somebody had needed to access their GP, whether they'd tried to contact their GP if they needed to, whether they were able to access their GP and whether this access was online or by telephone or face to face, online or by telephone or face to face. So results, I'll start with GPPS results and then I'll go back to the Unsung Society results. So pre-COVID-19, we looked at, we found overall that there was a small difference in the time until somebody could see or speak to a GP among people with and without multimorbidity. People with zero or four or more conditions have a slightly better experience, about one to two percentage points better. But among everyone with and without multimorbidity, there's a large 20 percentage point improvement after chat practice changed over to a telephone triage approach. So everyone saw respect to a GP faster on average after a practice changes to telephone triage with no differential impact for people with multimorbidity. So there's a big change when telephone triage comes in, but it doesn't seem to increase inequalities for people with multimorbidity. This is data hot off the press. New 2021 data are available for GPPS there today. I got them off the internet. Um, and actually, this shows the same thing. Um, this shows that actually during COVID-19 in GP practices, so we're looking at the dark blue bars um, for here. And actually, there's an increase in 2021. People do see or speak to their GP more quickly. Uh, and here, it, for a week or more later, there's a big reduction from 2020 in the number of people waiting a week or more to see or speak to their GP. So again, this kind of tells us that probably during 20 2021, during COVID-19, we're seeing the same impact in our GPPS data as well. In understanding society, understanding society, it actually tells us really interesting data, really interesting things about um, what was happening in primary care during at the start of the pandemic. Anecdotally, GPs weren't very busy in April 2020, kind of, it was the start of pandemic and, and kind of GP colleagues were saying, actually, we're a bit worried, where are the patients? Um, and then because there are survey waves, we could look at each, uh, each wave separately over time to see what's happening. So actually, each month, about 50% of the respondents reported they had a problem for which they needed to see or speak to their GP. And over 90% of people who did try to make an appointment with their GP were able to do so. And these were kind of fairly constant across each wave. But only about... 20% of people saw a GP face-to-face -face in April 2020 of those who had an appointment. And this had risen to about 40% by November. So the majority, even in November 2020, the majority of the appointments were still online or by telephone. Hey, Katie, two minutes. Yeah, two minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, for, so one of our findings was that actually in um, April 2020, only, I apologise for the access on this graph, only about 80% of people who had a problem try, tried to contact their GP for this problem. And um, by July kind of 2020, actually over 90% of people who had a problem for which they'd normally tried to see their GP uh, were making an appointment. So it was quite a, a short term reduction in people trying to make an appointment. Um, and again, we see that the number of appointments that were face-to-face -face increased to about 40% uh, by November 2020. For people living with multimorbidity, we find that they were more likely to need to see a GP, but there was no evidence of any difference for people with multimorbidity, whether they tried to access GP if they did have a problem, whether they were access, able to access a GP, or whether the appointment was face-to-face -face or by telephone or online. So some very quick reflections. Telephone triage is introduced at the practice level or during COVID-19, it's kind of introduced nationally. It had a very big impact on some measures of access to primary care when it started, and it can have a heterogeneous impact between different practices. We found people with multimorbidity are more likely to need to see a GP, but actually we found no evidence pre-2020 or post-COVID-19 that the impact of switching to telephone triage has a differential impact on primary care access for people with multimorbidity despite this differential level of need. 
kind of thought, well, actually, on reflection, this isn't hugely surprising. But what it is, what it kind of tells us is the impact of change to telephone triage is large compared with existing inequalities. And my final point is that actually these understanding society data on primary care and other healthcare access has been really important. While preparing these presentations, uh, there are three other analyses that have looked at various dimensions of, of kind of access to healthcare and inequality and access to healthcare during COVID-19. So it seemed worth highlighting them there. And then some interesting methods things. Um, for example, we found that 20% of appointments were face-to-face -face in April 2020. And actually, if you look at the electronic healthcare records, they're saying about 50%. So there's some very interesting kind of things about what survey measures and electronic healthcare record measures of access to healthcare during the pandemic. Thanks.